Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Smoke. I am very fortunate and very excited. I'm here at 88 Lounge and I'm, I got a chance to sit with a really good guy. This is general manager right here. His name is Jacob of 88 Lounge. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here. Awesome. We, let's get right, right into it. I've heard so much about 888. Talk about this lounge and how you got involved with it. So this lounge is a, uh, just an amazing place and I'm biased as all hell. I started in the industry at 19 years old because my pops smoked cigars. And you know, I had a 1964 Padron and a Rosario. I almost turned green because I inhaled the first few puffs. And uh, I don't know, I ended up liking it though for some reason, you know? It brought my pops and I closer, gave us some bond over and, and have a conversation, you know, just and, and relax. Mm -hmm. So I started interviewing as a uh, bar back. I wanted to be a bartender, so I started off as a bar back actually at Roscoe's down the street here in Fullerton. And uh, once I learned the alcohol industry there, I happened to know the general manager at the time here, he was my uncle. Mm. And uh, he says, hey, I got a position opening up for cigar sales. Well, I couldn't do it until I was 21. So I had to wait two years. Mm -hmm. And at 21, I came on board and just fell in love. Awesome. I fell in love with, and it was actually here that I, I started my uh, cigar industry experience. And I took a two year break. The old owner had done some things that, you know, the lounge wasn't lounge anymore. So Roger, the new owner took over two years ago and I came back and we just, we crushed it. We, wow. we had a business plan that was, let's be the cheers of the cigar industry. Okay. You know, let's just remember people's names and talk to them and get to know them on a personal level. And uh, it, it just blew up, it really did. We went from 120 members uh, two years ago with only about 30 to 40 active, to 650 members now. Wow. And it, it just became this monster. It did. It, it, it's, been a lot of fun and we've met a lot of great people and we've done a lot of cool stuff. Well, it's interesting because when I first got here, this is my first time visiting. I, I just like, wow, this culture is really interesting. The vibe was perfect right when I walked through the door. Can you describe the culture here at 888? So we do, uh, we hire based off of culture. Mm. In, in my hiring interviews that was developed by Roger and I, we hire based off culture. Mm. So where we believe the culture starts is the staff first. We make sure all the staff are warm, welcoming people. Like the bartender you met today, mm -hmm. she started off as a cocktail waitress with us. No bartending experience. Wow. We trained her in-house, groomed her, and now she's one of our best bartenders. The culture here is that cheers vibe. It's you come in and you're not just a dollar sign, you're not just a customer, you're a member or a potential member. Mm -hmm. We want you to feel included here. Mm. We want you to feel like this is somewhere you can get away this is your hangout. If yeah. you want to come play pool, great. You want to do a business meeting with six of your guys, awesome. You want to watch a football game, just relax and have a beer, come here. Wow. You know, we don't, we don't want it to feel like dollar signs. That's it. Our culture is just come in, warm, welcoming, family feel. I love it. And you know, we all get together. I mean, we do monthly golf outings. Well, 30 people show up. Wow. Not a tournament. It's yeah, just, yeah, it's just, just hanging out. It's just, hey, let's go golfing this Saturday. Okay. Wow. And by the end of the week, there's 30 people that are like, hey, we'll meet you there. And we show up to the golf course like, oh, this is a small tournament. No, this is just an outing. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's what it is. The culture here is just family type feel. Well, really you, you, you mentioned that uh, 888 is a membership based lounge. Mm -hmm. Describe the benefits of having a membership based lounge. So the benefits are we one reason we're a membership lounge and, and it's not because we're trying to come off as this hoity toity people. Mm -hmm. We have to. Mm -hmm. One of the legalities for us to have indoor tobacco and full bar wine, spirits, and beer, not just beer and wine, mm -hmm. is to have a membership fee. It's a grandfather license that is very, very, very hard to get in California, mm -hmm. if not impossible. And by being a membership lounge, it allows us to have both. So that's the first Ooh. reason for having it. The second reason is it immediately eliminates riffraff. Okay. We don't, we are in a heavily college town. Yeah. We're surrounded by three colleges, you know, very close to us. Right. We have no fights, no calls of service because the $35 a month, it automatically makes it something that you're committing to. Sure. So you don't have to like cigars to be a member. You have to really like spirits to be a member. You're not just going to be a young college kid and join and be, become a member. Right. So with the membership, you get 10 guests per visit. You get a 10% discount on your cigars. Okay. We do all the UFC fights. We do live music once a month. 
and we do uh, private events. So we'll do whiskey tasting, scotch tasting, uh, wine tasting. Yes. You know, we have ladies' nights. Yes. We do a lot of things for our members to give back. Yeah. And the membership ends up paying for itself. It ends up with a 10% discount if you buy cigars. And then, you know, members only events where you're getting handouts. There's plenty of things that go on that make the membership worth it. Awesome. Now, we spoke a little bit off camera yes, about intimidation. I think people, some people feel intimidated coming into a cigar lounge. They don't know what cigar to pick. We talk about people who are, talk about people who are feel maybe a little intimidated coming yeah. into this kind of space. You know, we, we like those people because we like to believe that we're good at our job and we'll make that a non-intimidating thing. Uh, nine times out of 10, if I get a rookie smoker up front or someone who doesn't even know what a cigar lounge is or entails, oh. we've trained our staff to give them recommendations on cigars that are gonna be non-offensive. Mm. We've given the, our staff the proper training to know uh, what alcohol may be more mellow. Mm -hmm. We try getting them in the door and making them realize what the culture of the cigar industry is so that they're less intimidated. I think if people see the, the love and the, you know, the passion and the art behind cigars, mm -hmm. that intimidation goes away. Okay. The second you step in a lounge and you really get to know what's behind cigars, that intim intimidation goes away. Yeah. But I think, you know, rightfully so. It's how the media is portrayed, health concerns. You know, they bundle cigars with cigarettes. They yeah. bundle cigars with everything else that doesn't need to be bundled with. It's yeah. a different industry. We're not putting out a heavily chemical based product. And then I think there's a, an intimidation factor with social status that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think there's intimidation with uh, sexual status that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of women smokers now. Yes. You know, and I think women like coming somewhere where they see other women. Mm -hmm. So when we have our women, mem our women members here, it is more fun than it's ever been, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause that, that wasn't true about eight years ago when I first got in this industry, we maybe had a 5% women membership basis. We're definitely in that 15, 20%. And they're not just women coming with husbands, they're women that own their own businesses, mm. that smoke cigars, mm. that drink bourbon, mm. that are very successful entrepreneurs in their own, in their own minds, yeah. you know, in their own rights. So yeah. I think, uh, the intimidation only exists like anything else in life until you give it a try. Yeah. And I think once you come down, especially in a lounge like this, where you meet some good people, you have great conversation, those intimidation walls get brought down really quickly. Well, one thing, I mean, 888 is a successful lounge. We, we spoke about there being a renaissance within the cigar culture. What, you being a general manager, how do you develop a successful lounge, in your opinion? Oh man, it starts with the staff. It mm -hmm. does. If you don't have good people working for you that know their product knowledge is high and that really understand customer service, you're not going to succeed at all because this is a very, this industry is old school. It's mm -hmm. still handshakes and smiles and, and connections, you know, and if your staff doesn't connect with the customer and they don't, you know, if we say we're going to have this great business culture where you're cheers only, Roger and I are only two guys, Yeah, you know? So having Roger and I come around and meet people and talk to people is a huge part of it. But then the staff, when we're not here or when we're not visiting everybody at once, they are the key to this all, man. Mm -hmm. they, if I don't have good, I love my staff. If I didn't have the staff I do, do today, we would not be as successful as we are, wow. period. Great. So that's where it starts. And then having the right customer bases is number two. If you got a guy who comes in and he's getting you know, piss throwing up drunk, it's not a good look. Yeah. But if you have guys coming in that are responsible, gentlemanlike, it's huge. So yeah. being picky about your membership basis, but not, you're not excluding anyone. You're just being selective. You're just saying this person fits the culture that we want. And I think that's the key is culture. Culture yeah. is key. To have a successful lounge, you got to know your culture. You got to know what you are and what are you trying to do? Mm. You're just trying to have a place where people smoke and hang out. Or are you trying to have a place that builds experiences and creates conversation like sure. we talked about a lot? Yeah. You know, that's the key to this whole thing yeah. is getting people that maybe I, I say my members, if they pass each other on the street before this place, never would have hung out with each other. Mm. It's only because of here yeah. and meeting here that yeah. they realize, wow, I have yeah. a lot in common with this guy right yes. here. Yes, yes. And we and talk about it. conversation. Yeah. quite a bit. And um, to kind of piggyback what you were saying, we were discussing that there were, 
it's clearly a renaissance in the cigar culture. Absolutely. Well, with the renaissance, you have a lot of novices. You have a lot of people who are new to the culture. Can you give uh, somewhat of a guide for the beginner smoker? Okay. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Mm. You know, don't <laughs> don't think you know it because you don't. <laughs> right. Don't be the guy that goes into my humidor and says, oh, yeah, you know, my dad likes the Fuentes and, and think you know everything about cigars. Yeah. Like what I've learned about the cigar industry, and I even to this day have, I've been in eight years, and it still happens to me. You have to be humble mm. and you have to be real. Mm. Like if you don't know something, you don't pretend to in this industry because I tell my staff, I go, there's going to be people that come to this lounge and know a lot about tobacco. And you're going to sit there and suggest them this, and they're going to go, you don't know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then vice versa. There's yeah. a lot of, like you said, what, what could you tell the new guys? Ask your tobacconists at the shop what they like to smoke. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is my first time, or mm -hmm. I've only had two cigars in my life. Mm -hmm. Again, I think, like, you going back to our whole, the whole purpose of this. Yeah. Conversation. Sure takes down the intimidation. Sure. You know, if they just talk to the people in the, in the shop, that's what we're paid to do. That's mm -hmm. what we love to do. We mm -hmm. love to talk about our product. Right. So I think just the rookie just needs to come in. Hey, how do you properly cut light a cigar? I mean, that's the most important. That's literally the, the fundamentals, most important. right? Yeah. Like the fundamentals. Anything, when, when you pick up a sport, right? You don't go, I'm going to pick up basketball and start at the three-point line. Yeah. Start free throws. Yeah. Because you know, if you can't hit a free throw, you're not going to hit a jump shot. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the thing is, is people just need to be open to conversation, dialogue with other people and say, hey, you know, how do I cut like this cigar? Or this is my first or second time. What cigar do you recommend? Mm -hmm. You know, and it'll, it'll be easy from there. Okay. You know? So I'm a new smoker. I come in. I've never smoked a cigar before. Do you suggest I go mild first? Yeah. What, what are your what are your so, top mild cigars? Anytime I get a new smoker, there's a few lines I gravitate towards okay. and a few shades of tobacco. All right. So anything from Dominican Republic or Honduras typically mm -hmm. is going to be more mellow. Okay. So I'll recommend them a line from Fuente or I'll recommend them a line from Alec Bradley. So Alec Bradley would be like the Connecticut, the Coil, mm -hmm. uh, the Sanctum. Mm -hmm. Those are three really easy Alec Bradley smoke. Even the black market, it looks like a Maduro but it's a Honduran blend, so it's not super offensive, no pepper, it's not super earthy, it's just very unilateral, very easy to smoke, easy to get through. Same thing with like Arturo Fuente. You can go with the 858 Florfina. You can go with the Hemingway short story through their classic size. They're all the same Cameroon wrapper. Sure. And it's Cameroon tobacco from Africa, so it's got a sweetness to it, it's very mild. Uh, it's like a caramel cigar, I, I describe it as. Mm -hmm. And then you can even try brands like Oliva. They do have Nicaraguan blends that are now more mild, but it's, again, it's Cameroon. It's the aged Cameroon O or the Connecticut, you know, reserve from Oliva, the Connecticut line. The O's, the G's. I wouldn't re recommend a V. I wouldn't recommend a Milano. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend, you know, the Le Bijou you're smoking. Mm -hmm. Stick to Connecticut Shade or Cameroon. It's not saying that all Maduros are full bodied. Mm -hmm. It's just, you don't want to blast the person's palate too soon. You sure. want to introduce them to cigars yeah. and teach them how to taste and smoke and enjoy. You know, you want them to have lower nicotine content because you don't know how nicotine sensitive they are. You don't know if they're going to get the shakes or sweats. Sure. You just want them to enjoy the experience. So give them something mild, always a start. Beginner smoker, mild. Even some of the acid lines we talked about off camera. Mm -hmm. um, don't be afraid to sell them a flavored cigar. It's not what I personally do, yeah. but some people prefer that. You know, the Java from Rocky Patel, mm, yeah. very easy cigar very to smoke. Easy. Yeah. The Upsetter from Foundation, very easy cigar to smoke. The CEO Flavors from General Cigars, very easy cigars to smoke. Mm -hmm. So those, they have their purpose, you know? And that's what a lot of women actually love flavored cigars a lot Absolutely. of first time women smokers come in what i want, I want something chocolatey you give them the java yeah they love it they mm -hmm. enjoy it you yeah. know and that's what we're trying to do again just enjoy the experience so what are there any common mistakes that you see from a novice, but even maybe a little bit more experienced smokers you say ah, yeah don't make... share cigars okay if you're a full-grown man don't <laughs> share your cigar with another man right. there's no need you know i don't care if he's your boy your right. brother right i don't do that right <laughs> don't right. share cigars right. it's I, weird. i've seen it's a couple weird. of things that kind of bother me it's not natural <laughs> say i'm in a humidor and another guy's in a humidor and the guy is kind of sniffing it a little too close to his nose okay well this is there's there's, there's things like that man. these Come are on. my rookie tell signs right okay. let's, let's i'm in go. the humidor with a customer 
He's smelling it through the super through the cellophane. He's <laughs> Superman. He's smelling a cigar through cellophane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the 1.2 millimeter of plastic in between you and that cigar. And you, mm, <laughs> no. The second thing is, I love smelling my cigars. If I'm intending to buy that cigar, don't be sticking it in your nose and then putting it back in the hey, box. Please you pay know? attention to this. This That's, is very good information. It's just not right. Yeah. You know, no one wants to smoke a cigar with your mocos on it. Come yes. on, man. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and then cutting it. I mean, you can tell a rookie from the cut. Mm. You know, they cut too far down. The yeah. cigar starts unraveling. And then they blame my humidor. Your humidor is dry. No, no. you cut half the cigar yeah, off. Yeah, but you're I understand right. what a cap is. Yes, the cap is a Right clear. below. Yes. I don't have a Okay, cap rookie, right. here. This is a great tutorial. Okay. You want to cut your cigar right? Okay. You put your cutter on a table. Mm -hmm. You put your cigar in it. And you squeeze it. There you go. That's it. You're only cutting a quarter inch off that cigar maximum. It's an easy way to do it. Perfect. There you go. Free tip from Beyond the Smoke. <laughs> um, okay. Now, we also spoke about developing your palate. Mm. Um, a lot of people I smoke with, they have a hard time. They say, oh, I can't really taste the flavors. Do you have any type of, of advice on how to develop a, a decent palate? So, I think the big problem is... Uh, Cigars, to me, are synonymous with wine. Uh, wine and cigars go hand in hand as far as the growing and the agriculture and the, uh, the nuance with it, the sexiness of it. But the thing is, with wines, you don't start typically drinking, you know, Malbecs and Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. You start by drinking whites or Shiraz or you start by drinking a, a non-offensive cab, you know, um, and it's the same with cigars. A lot of people say, oh, you just gotta smoke a lot of cigars. No, I don't agree with that. You gotta smoke a lot of the right cigars. To develop a palate, you gotta know what you're trying to pick up in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. If you know nothing about cigars, then you probably don't know that Nicaraguans tend to have more depth. Mm -hmm. If you know nothing about cigars, you don't know that Connecticut's tend to be more, what I call a pancake cigar. They're airy, they're fluffy, they're unilateral, they don't change one-dimensional mm -hmm. and that's what you got to start learning you start with your lighter shade tobacco so you learn that this is a product that's not going to peak or valley it's mm -hmm. just going to be consistent the whole way through then you got something like your Le Bichu. you know you start that cigar off very big peppery punch yes. right off the bat love it i mean pepper stick i yeah. call it yeah but then it creams out it mellows yeah. out yeah, it your palate's getting used to it and you're accepting this flavor that you're tasting now. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna be a drastic jump from even what I'm smoking. This is a Tatuaje Cojonu, um, broadleaf wrapper. It, it's not gonna be as pungent as this Le Bijou, mm -hmm. even though it's also Nicaraguan. You know, it's just a matter of, uh, you gotta learn what regions of Nicaragua carry different flavors, what regions of Honduras, Costa Rica, Ecuador carry their, you know, their characteristics. Cause Tobacco is growing everywhere now. Like 10 years ago, if it was a Maduro, it was strong. Yeah. That's gone now. It okay, doesn't well, exist. That, that leads me to my next question because a lot of people, they associate, okay, it's a lighter wrapper, automatically the smoke no. is going to be light. It's a darker wrapper, automatically the smoke is going to be dark. That's not necessarily true. Like, right? This wrapper is light, but you wouldn't look at it and say that's not a Maduro, correct? You'd right. look at it and say it's a Maduro. Right. One of the smoothest cigars you can have in the morning. Mm. And it's a Nicaraguan. So it's defied all the, the you know, basic stereotypes. Nicaraguan, bold, peppery, spicy, no. Uh, Maduro, bold, peppery, spicy, no. So how do you determine a strength of a cigar? That is knowledge, product knowledge. Ah. Because modern day farming has gotten so good. And these guys have become chemists on cigars. Cigars aren't what they used to be, you know. Cigar history is very interesting. Before the aficionado boom, mm -hmm. we refer to, that was the 90s. In, in the mid 90s to early thousands, there was this aficionado boom where the ceiling was literally lifted on cigar smokers. It went from, you know, the elite and only certain people smoking cigars to everybody was smoking cigars during the 90s, yeah. everybody. Yeah. And that brought the basis of cigar smokers up, even though the trend went down eventually. Mm. So yes, the trend fell off, but it raised the floor mm. on the cigar smokers. Most people don't remember, but, and, and obviously it's before my time, but I love this, so I studied the history of cigars. Yeah. When Kennedy did his embargo on Cuba, what it did was it created all these guys from Cuba, like the Fuente family who was kicked out of Cuba. Their farms were taken away, their factories were taken away. He came to Florida with seeds in his pocket. Yeah. So he started his company out of his garage. There used to be, there's a famous picture of 
Fuente Cigars, arrow pointing right, hand painted on a sign in front of his house. That's how his, that's where his roots are. It's all he knew. Yeah. But what it did was it created a gap. There was now a bunch of Americans that wanted to smoke cigars, but had nowhere to buy them. So these companies popped up in the DR. These companies popped up in Nicaragua. These companies uh, popped up in Honduras and Ecuador and Costa Rica and Brazil and Mm -hmm. all these weird places because they were trying to emulate the conditions of Cuba. They're trying to emulate the agriculture of Cuba. They had to get it somehow. All they had was the knowledge. They didn't have Cuba. Mm. So they made what they did best they could. And they did it in the DR predominantly. They did it in Nicaragua. And at that time, the, the soil was fresh. It wasn't tended. It wasn't farmed for tobacco necessarily. Yeah, tobacco existed, don't get me wrong. But it wasn't done the way the Cubans do it, right? The Cubans age everything. They're patient. It's an art form in Cuba still. I mean, the, you're talking seven years to learn how to roll a Lancero. You look at it, you got know, it's the thinnest cigar in the world. It's the hardest cigar to roll. So they are still perfectionists. And now it's been farmed for 30, 40, 50 years. Mm. That land's been turned over for 30, 40, 50 years. It's gotten the phosphorus and the magnesium and all the nutrients that is best for tobacco plants. And that's why you can't judge the product by the region anymore because now they've bought seeds from different places. They've created hybrid plants. They've gotten better at the farming, where they're picking from the plant. They've learned about the agriculture of cigars and it's changed the game. It's made it so, yeah. Nowadays, there's chances that a Maduro can be less offensive and lighter Mm. than a Connecticut. Take an example. The Padron Connecticut, it's the Damaso. It's one of my favorite Padrones mm-hmm. because I like Nicaraguan tobacco. Right. It's a spicy Connecticut. That is a Connecticut that is way more robust than an Alec Bradley black market, even mm-hmm. though the black market is darker in color. Yeah. You know, the, those days are gone. Now you do. You have to ask the tobacconist or you have to know your product knowledge. You, you, there's no color scale anymore like it so, used to be. Again, goes back to what, what he was saying is you have to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Ask questions when you go into a cigar lounge, do not be intimidated. No. Ask a lot of questions, kind of get an idea of what you want. Um, and I guarantee you won't be the first. You won't be the first person to ask, is this peppery? Is this, you know, it's daily questions. Well, you, you are very knowledgeable about cigars, but talk about your first ever cigar experience. Like I said, it was a 1964 Padron. It was the worst cigar my dad could have ever given me. And I thought, I think he was trying to pull the pops card, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're 17, you want to smoke a cigar, you know? I think he was trying to get me less into it than he did. Mm -hmm. Um, So we sit down, I'll I'll never forget, we're we're in our garden around a fire pit. We light up these cigars, no clue what I'm doing, you know? I can barely get the lighter open. So I get the lighter open, I click it, I'm lighting my cigar, and he's like, don't inhale. Of course I'm inhaling, you know? <laughs> of course Only thing inhale. I've done is smoke cigarettes and hookah. I'm 17 years old, you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. So I inhale this cigar and I'm maybe three, four puffs into it. And it's, a, it's a 64 Padron. It's a in-your-face Nicaraguan. Yeah, we're not playing. No, and I turn green, you know? And I'm not the Hulk, <laughs> yeah. so it wasn't meant to be green. Oh, and, man. Uh, but yeah, it, it ended up not being a good experience. I don't think I touched a cigar for like three months, four months after that. And oh, then, man. Now I'm, I'll never forget, for whatever reason, I remember I turned 18 that same year, right? And at 18 years old, one of the things I wanted to do was buy a cigar and buy a lotto ticket. So I did both. I bought wow. a lotto ticket and a cigar at this tiny liquor store in La Mirada that had a tiny wall humidor. And uh, that cigar was the Rocky Patel Edge. I'll mm. never forget that also. It was the, at the time it was, maybe $5.50, you know, because the taxes were way lower. And uh, and it was enjoyable. I mean, it was an easy smoke. And to this day, I still have them in my humidor. Awesome. Yeah, it's still, the 64 and the Edge are still in the humidor. Awesome. And I'll, I grab the 64 now 64 more than the 64 is one of my edge. favorite Yeah, sticks. it's hands down. Oh my God. I, I tell people all the time that whether you like them or hate them, Padron is the cigar to beat. They are. Man. And they don't, what I love about them is they have that passion and they have that, that, stick to itiveness to make it happen they age their product they're not afraid to say and eh, this isn't that good mm-hmm. you know they know what they're doing those guys are pros they are well cool thing about 888 is that not only is it a cigar lounge but it's also a bar and i know that there's a <laughs> lot of people out there that are very interested in pairing your cigars so number one question that i get how do i pair my cigar with what alcohol well this guy knows a lot about it, and there's a bar. So we're going to go check it out right now. We're going to talk about some pairings, all right? 
Stay tuned. A lot of people talk about pairing cigars. What should you pair with what? This is the guy who knows. Jacob from 888 is going to tell us a little bit about pairing cigars. Give us the, what are the, the rules of this thing? Is there any place to start? Okay, so there's no real rules. Okay. But in my opinion, okay. what, from what I've learned, with bourbon, you want to pair it with something a little spicy, a little more pepper, or even a higher nicotine content cigar, a bolder cigar for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to go with a super light cigar. If you go with a Connecticut, the problem is going to be you're going to taste the bourbon, but you're never going to taste the cigar, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, your palate is being pounded mm -hmm. by that bourbon. So if you introduce a cigar that's too mellow, your palate's not even going to pick it up. Your palate's being handled by that bourbon. So I typically go with a Maduro, Nicaraguan, something full body, the Lebeju you're smoking, uh, one of the Tatuaje Reservas, go with the Tabernacle, something that's going to hold up very well. With scotches, it depends on the region, right? There's some scotches that are very mellow. There are some scotches that are very bold, very in your face, like Lafroy. Right, so with Lafroy, you follow the lines of bourbon a little more, a, a more robust smoke. But with the Scapas and the Taliskers and the Obans and the lighter scotches, Japanese whiskey you asked about also, right? You want to pair it with something a little more delicate. I do like a Milano, I would do a Fuente Hemingway, a Fuente Don Carlos. You could do like the Opus X, Opus X. You can get into the Dunhill Aged from General. You do any of the Alec Bradleys with a lot of scotches, they go very well because Alec Bradleys, again, have that very mild to medium, uh, neutral to semi-acidic profile. My favorite thing to pair with are wines. I do. I love pairing with wines because they're tricky. You know, if you're, if you're drinking like Chardonnays, it's going to be hard to pair any cigar with this Chardonnay. Okay. They're acidic, they're, they're peri, they're fruity, right? So that's going to be hard. A flavor cigar might do well, but eh, it's going to be hard. But Merlots, Malbecs, Bordeaux, Shiraz, Red Blends, you can really, at that point, it depends on just what cigar you like. You can really marry cigars a lot more than you can with wine than you can specific spirits. Okay. You know, vodka, gins, martinis, stuff like that, it's kind of a hit and miss. It's really hard to pair cigars with clear spirits, so we call them. Brown spirits go better with cigars than clear spirits do. Okay, cool. It, it's just a general rule of thumb. Let me throw you a curveball. Okay. People who don't drink alcohol. I've seen things oh, online. This is easy. Here and this there. Is easy. People are pairing cigars with okay, root beers. Home run out of the park. Come on. Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper is the number one thing you can pair a cigar with or coffee. Really? Dr. Pepper or coffee. You Coffee is phenomenal, but if you think I'm lying, you take a cigar when you leave today, you go stop at a store by Dr. Pepper. Crack it open, message me later, and say that okay. it's not the best damn variant. Wow, ever. It's, there we I don't are. know what it is. There we are. Well, we are uh, here again, 888. Jacob, general manager here for Beyond the Smoke. Another episode. Thank you so much for hey, being my guest. Thank you so much I for appreciate coming it, in and just linking up. And you know what? Something we didn't talk about back there, but the power of social media, the yes. power of connecting. Yes. We met through social media. Yes, we you did. came down. You're now a dear friend. Whenever you and your brother want to come down, please come Thank on down. Thank you so I'd much. Love to have you guys. There you go. Be on the smoke. Peace.